If your machine shop has already assembled your heads and you don't want to have to take them apart, you'll need to get a pair of solid lifters from your local parts store. You should mark them to set them apart from your other lifters. When rotating an engine by hand, there's no oil pressure. Stock valve springs are very strong and when the cam starts to push up on the lifter, the plunger inside a hydraulic lifter would push down inside the lifter body. This is because there's no oil pressure built up inside the lifter to push it up. A solid lifter won't allow the push rod to sink into the lifter body. As the solid lifter begins to come up, even with no oil pressure, it'll overcome the strength of the stock valve spring and make the valve in the head open all the way. If you need to build one of your heads with the stock springs for the test, pull the correct intake and exhaust valves out of the organizer tray for the number one cylinder head. Make sure the valves have some lubricant on the stems, put on any spring shims if you have them, and then the spring and retainer. Most likely, now you're either going to have new springs or shims that'll make the old springs tighter. So squeezing the valve spring compressor by hand right now might feel a little bit tougher. You need to squish the spring far enough to be able to slip in the keepers. Jiggle the compressor a little bit if you have to, but be careful. If you jiggle too far, the compressor could slip off and the spring would go shooting across the room might pop you in the eye. We recommend you wear safety glasses when you look at the valve tip to fit the keepers in. If you can leave a hand on the keepers to prevent them from falling while you release the tension on the compressor, it'll help. Now your cylinder head is ready for the test. Have your pair of solid lifters nearby. If you're not able to get a hold of some solid lifters, you'll have to get some lightweight checking springs from a performance or hot rod supplier to use with your regular hydraulic lifters. When rotating an engine by hand with no oil pressure, a hydraulic lifter is overcome by the valve spring pressure and the movable plunger that's inside the lifter will sink down as the cam begins to push up on it. This would keep the valve from opening all the way for a proper piston to valve clearance check. Your hydraulic lifters can be used for this test, but only if the valve springs being used are lightweight springs that won't cause the lifter plunger to push down inside the lifter body. If your heads are already assembled, you're going to need to take out the stock springs for the number one cylinder. If they're not assembled yet, pull the correct intake and exhaust valves out of the organizer tray for the number one cylinder head and make sure that the stems have some lubricant. Place a spring in one of the heads and use the retainer to push the spring down far enough so you'll be able to slip in the keepers that'll hold the retainer in place. When both of the valves are in for the number one cylinder, the head is ready for the test. Have the right pair of hydraulic lifters for that cylinder nearby. Section 7, Installation. In this section, you will reinstall your motor into the chassis. Whether or not your engine bay has been modified, cleaned, or restored in any way, you need to give it a thorough once-over. Take a moment to look over your removal notes and diagrams or photos. The workspace around and under the car should be clean and your chassis should be securely positioned once again. With a basic set of tools nearby and your engine ready for hoisting, let's get your motor back in. Before your motor can go back in, consider your transmission and how you're going to hoist the assembly. If your automatic transmission was left in the chassis, it should be supported back in its up position. If you have a new torque converter, it should have a quart of automatic transmission fluid in it and be back in place. If you're hoisting the engine and automatic transmission together, you should have fluid in the torque converter but none in the transmission. That way none will leak out the rear tail shaft while it's angled for the install. If you have a manual transmission, don't try to install the block only and then made it to a manual transmission that's in the chassis already. It'll be really tough to get everything to match up from under the car. It is possible to fit an automatic transmission to an already installed block with a transmission jack, but it's not our preferred method. First, you'll want to install your hoisting chain or plate. If your hood was removed, you'd have enough room to be able to use one of these engine levelers. They help a lot if you're installing an engine and transmission combo. Now it's time to raise up the motor and carefully roll it in. Go nice and slow as you lower the engine into the bay. Just lower a bit and adjust the hoist and then lower some more and make some more adjustments. If you have the transmission connected, it's going to take a lot of adjustments of the angle of the assembly to get it to clear 
the firewall, and the radiator mounting brackets. Having an automatic transmission at this extreme angle is the reason why you don't want to fill it with the fluid yet. As the motor gets closer to its mounts, you'll need to take a look under the car to make sure that the exhaust and everything on the underside is clear too. If you're trying to match up to an existing transmission, you'll need to go very slowly and check often to be able to get the motor and the transmission to line up with each other. When they get close, you should make sure any wires at the rear or sides of the block are clear. Then when you finesse the angle and height of the motor, you should be able to guide the alignment pins in the back of the block into the alignment holes in the transmission bell house. When both pins are lined up with the holes, give the hoist a solid push against the transmission and the block should mate with the bell house. If the dowels are still not lined up right, make some slight adjustments up or down and give the hoist another push. Once the block and transmission mate, you can install the lower and mid bell house bolts and tighten them. When the bolts are tight, you can remove your transmission shims or transmission jack and you can lower the engine onto its mounts. Sometimes the alignment of the mounts seems off and the engine position will seem like it needs to move toward the rear of the chassis to allow the mounts to drop in place. If this happens, you can either loosen the lower halves of the mounts that are on the frame or loosen the bolts that hold the transmission to its frame cross member in the rear or pry the lower halves over as someone else is slowly lowering the motor for you. You might have to do all three of those things if it's being really stubborn. If it's still too tight, as a last resort, you could also loosen the bell house bolts that you just put in, and all this fidgeting should let the motor drop down onto its mounts, and then you can put back and tighten up everything that you loosened and roll your hoist out. With the hoist out of the way, you can get back under and make sure the lower bell house bolts are tight, and then hook the torque converter back up if you have an automatic. Then automatic or manual transmission shifter linkages can get put back together. Now you can put your exhaust back together. The gasket set for your engine may or may not have exhaust gaskets. If you have a shield that protects the starter wires from the exhaust, you should take care of it now to protect them. Then set the starter on a block of wood to hook up the wires. Have one bolt in the starter before you lift it up and then thread that bolt in a few turns by hand. When the starter will hang on that one bolt, you can fit in the other bolt. If your starter had shims when you pulled it out, you should put them back in with the starter now. Tighten the two bolts and you can cover the bell house and starter once you're sure that all the wires are routed safely around the exhaust. Back up on top of the engine bay, start down deep and work your way up. We did the fuel pump lines first and then the lower radiator hose. This car already had the transmission cooling lines hooked up. For the front accessories, we started with the steering pump that we had swung out of the way. Usually the fan shroud will have to go in before the fan. This is a new water pump and pulley, but we know that the belts are going to line up because we checked them in pre-assembly. Our belts were still labeled in the right order. It's actually a better idea to just replace them if they have any signs of wear. If you get new belts of the same lengths, the marks and order of your old belts will help you get everything back together. When the fan and water pump pulleys are all set, the shroud can get buttoned up. We did the alternator next, and then we remembered that we had a hidden spacer behind one of the brackets on one of our engines when we opened up our alternator drawer of the storage bin. Don't forget to go back and look over your notes from the removal. You'll be reminded of little things like the hidden spacer or other notes that you made. You want to have your belts very tight. After all the pumps and accessories, you can finish off the radiator with the upper hose. When it's time to reinstall your top side lines, wires, and hoses, you're going to thank yourself for writing everything down and taking pictures. If you don't have any previous notes, you should be able to get everything straight by consulting a repair manual and looking at the diagrams and schematics for your engine and chassis. After each piece goes back in or gets connected, you can tear off the label and then move on to the next thing that still has a number on it. There's always an order of events when you're putting things on the top side back together. If you put some hose or bracket back on too early, you might block something that was meant to go on first, so just refer to your notes and go in the opposite order of your removal process. Take your time reconnecting everything too. If a hose clamp for a heater hose goes on a little crooked, you could end up overheating the engine down the road. 
or if a fuel line fitting isn't tightened properly, you could have a fire hazard that would have been avoided if you just took the time to do it right with the right tool. If you left the distributor or wires off for the install, you'll want to square them away now. Usually the last steps are a series of vacuum lines and linkages. This is where you're really going to thank yourself for taking good notes. And pictures are as good as gold when you realize that you might have forgotten a label or two on a set of hoses that all look the same. There's always a mess of timing and emissions hoses, and the newer the car, the more complex the top end gets. Hopefully, your notes will guide you right back to a completed motor that's ready for the final checks. Section 8. Startup. In this section, you will be turning over your engine for the first time. The startup of the engine and break-in of a new camshaft is a critical procedure. If your engine has been sitting for longer than a week, you should remove the distributor and repeat the pre-oil process. It's imperative that oil has been circulated through your engine within a few days of starting it up. You're about to bring your hard work to life. Pay close attention to details as you get your engine ready for the big moment. Start out by double-checking all your gauge connections, linkages, and hoses. You want to make sure all your hose clamps are on straight and that they're tight. When you're sure your water system is sealed off, you can top off the radiator with fresh water. Don't put any coolant in right now. If there's a problem after startup, you might need to drain the radiator and clean water won't have to go into a catch container. When it's full, leave the cap off so the engine can purge any of the air pockets that are still trapped in the block and water lines when it starts up. Now the water system is prepped, let's think about the oil. Just check your dipstick and make sure that the level's okay. Add some oil if you need to. Next, for the fuel system, double check your fuel lines along the frame, at the pump, and on the top side. Make sure they're not near any exhaust pipes or pulleys or belts. Then if you have a carburetor, you need to squirt a few ounces of gas into the front fuel bowl vent to prime the carburetor. That should put enough gas in the carburetor to run the engine until the fuel pump takes over. There are hundreds of different designs for fuel delivery systems. Check your manual for suggestions on proper adjustment of your carburetor or your fuel injection system. Now it should be safe to hook your battery back up. Once a good battery is connected and fully charged, refer to your manual once more. The ignition section should have a listing that will tell you how to test your ignition for proper voltage or computer codes before attempting to crank the motor. If your engine has a distributor, you should double check the wiring sequence of the plug wires. The rotor that's under the cap of this particular distributor rotates clockwise, so starting from the number one tower that we had labeled earlier, we count the firing order in a clockwise direction and then follow each of the wires to the corresponding spark plug to make sure that everything's in order. If you have to, go through the firing order a few times to make absolutely sure that you don't have any crossed wires. Incorrect wiring is one of the most common startup problems. When everything checks out, you'll be ready to start your engine. If you have a new camshaft, the break-in procedure is critical. If not done properly, you run a high risk of a cam lobe going flat and ruining the internals of your new engine. Follow this break-in procedure and you should be fine. Have someone crank the engine for you, but keep your face out of the way because that might happen if your timing is a bit retarded. If the motor did just sputter, loosen the hold-down clamp for the distributor and advance it a little at a time until you get the motor to fire up. If it still won't start, you should go back and check your fuel and electrical supplies. When everything's correct and your advance is set right, the motor should fire right up. Once it does, if you have a new cam, you absolutely have to follow this camshaft break-in procedure. The basic formula is 20 minutes at 2000 RPM. The firm rule here is that the engine has to be running above 1500 RPM. Do not let it idle, even for a few seconds. If you notice a leak or another problem, you can shut off the engine and fix the problem, but once you fire it back up, you have to keep the RPMs above 1500. Every couple minutes, it is helpful to change the RPMs a little bit. You can change them anywhere from 1500 to 2500. These variations are gonna help properly break in the lobes of the cam and to keep enough oil splashing around inside the motor during the break-in. After about five or 10 minutes, you should see a little steam coming out of the open radiator and you should carefully top it off with some water now that the air pockets are burped out of the system. Then close off the radiator before it gets too hot to touch. 
For the rest of the break-in period, you should keep a close watch for leaks or any wires that might have adjusted and could be melting on a hot exhaust pipe or something. After a good solid 20 minute workout, you can bring the motor to a lower RPM and play with the idle so that the engine will run smooth enough to adjust the timing. Have a look in your repair manual to find the timing recommendation for your engine. Now you'll want to hook up a timing gun and connect the ignition lead to the number one spark plug wire. If you have a vacuum advanced distributor, you should also plug the suction side of the vacuum line where it goes into the carburetor or the intake manifold. Point the light at the timing indicator on the harmonic balancer and it'll tell you what the initial timing is set to. If you're not sure what you're looking for, then your repair manual should also give you some details on what your timing marks would look like on your engine. If the timing is off a few degrees, to change the setting, you'd loosen the distributor clamp and you would physically rotate the distributor as the engine is idling. The final goal for your rebuilt engine is to get it to idle smoothly at the lowest RPM possible while the timing gun is reading the recommended setting that was listed in your repair menu. When you're happy with it, you want to tighten down your distributor clamp, but then recheck the timing again because sometimes it changes when you tighten that hold down clamp. When everything checks out, you should be good to go. When the engine is idling smoothly and you verify that your fluids are all topped off and nothing is leaking, it'll be time for a test drive. Be sure to check your oil and filter after the first 500 miles and check your manual to see if your head bolts or any other fasteners are due for a retorquing at that time. If you have any other questions along the way, don't forget to stop by BoxWrench.net to ask any questions you might have in the community forum. Congratulations on a successful rebuild.